Bill 115 has been repealed, but that hardly means Ontario's education labour dispute is over. And who better to tell us about what's at the heart of the dispute than teachers themselves? And so, in Blind River, Ontario, via Skype, Ryan Forsyth, secondary school teacher with the Algoma District School Board. And with us here in studio, Wendy Jackman, secondary school teacher with the Waterloo Region District School Board. Katherine Hansen, elementary school teacher with the Peel District School Board. Lee Becker, secondary school teacher, also with the Peel District School Board. David Banerjee, elementary school teacher with the Toronto District School Board. And Adrian Goodman, elementary school teacher, also with the Toronto District School Board. We want you, of course, to be part of this conversation. So, uh, producer Meredith Martin and online producer Naveen Viswani are hosting a Twitter chat right now. Let us know your thoughts on the education labor dispute using the hashtag AgendaTVO. And with that, we welcome you five here in the studio. And Ryan, to you up in Northern Ontario, we're grateful that you could join us via Skype. We basically, a couple of weeks ago, wrote a blog post on our website asking teachers what they thought was missing from the whole Bill 115 conversation. And all of the guests on the program tonight are people who got back to us saying, well, you've missed this, 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 and this. And so we thought we'd invite you here and figure out what we're missing and get it on the record. Let's start with the original issue. From your perspective, Wendy, I want to start with you. Okay. What went wrong in the negotiations between the province and the teacher unions? Well, I think I can sum it up simply by saying it wasn't a negotiation. What was it? Uh, it was a group of lawyers who are bankruptcy lawyers arriving to the table and inviting our OSSTF union leaders to have a discussion. But basically what they did was say, here is what you may have and here is what we will do and here is <laughs> what you will agree to. You said bankruptcy lawyers? Mm -hmm. Seriously, they were yeah. bankruptcy lawyers? Three yeah. bankruptcy lawyers. And how do you know that? Uh, that's what my union told me because they wanted to find out what was going on and they said this is ridiculous what what's going on these people aren't the people we normally meet with they're people who know nothing about education and it turns out they're bankruptcy lawyers okay your your OSSTF yes I am who's ETFO here who's okay Catherine Hi. was it your understanding that that's what happened in the yes. ETFO negotiations as well yes they, I believe it was the same provincial pr discussion table same thing and uh, and it was bankruptcy lawyers and that, that, I believe, is where the problem started. I know that um, very early in, that, in the school year in 2011, um, our, our own local union came and met with individual schools and told us flat out at the beginning, before any discussions had ever started, that when our contracts expired in 2012, August, that we would not be asking for any more money. And nobody at the tables I was sitting at had any trouble with that. And that was the last discussion I heard of it, and that was in about October of 2011. And in spring of 2012, we got a memo, um, individual teachers got a memo from ETFO saying, we were called to this discussion, we went voluntarily, it wasn't part of normal negotiations. I believe Mr. McGinty phoned in himself, and, uh, and basically exactly what Wendy said was what we were told as well. What's your understanding of what went wrong here? Exactly the same, exactly the same. Was that it seems to me that there was a, um, a a lack of willingness to to even meet with negotiation from the government's point of view. Um, again, I heard the, exactly the same information about bankruptcy lawyers, and I think what that did was set in, set entirely the wrong tone off the beginning with, uh, with the union's negotiators, who I believe had gone in in good faith, expecting to see similar faces on the other side to the people that had negotiated them over previous bargaining rounds. So immediately being faced with a different set of people that were presenting us with a take it or leave it type deal, something like that I feel was bound to make the union feel, put them on the back foot and want to retrench before we'd even gone one step further. You so, saw it as a threatening move? Um, I wouldn't see, I wouldn't say threatening, I would say um, it was, it was more of a, here's a brick wall, it's, it's our way or the highway. And <coughs> like several of us were discussing before we got on here, uh, negotiations about a conversation, it's about there has to be some degree of empathy, some degree of information going in both directions, as opposed to one side saying, here is our position, which is you know, adamantine, inflexible, take it or leave it. Let, that, me, let me get the view from Northern Ontario. Ryan, what's your understanding of where you believe things went off the rails in this thing? I share, uh, I share the sentiments of a lot of the other panelists. Basically, 
uh, we were held hostage by uh, by the possibility of a draconian law that could come vis-a-vis -vis, uh, legislation. So I, I pretty much agree with uh, with all the other panelists on uh, on what went wrong. Uh, from the beginning, there was uh, there was just the threat of uh, legislation that took away any meaningful dialogue, uh, goodwill, or respect uh, from the side of the government. Okay, but Bill 115 was not introduced until August. There was still there were plenty of months before that. And Lee, let me get you on this. Uh, Premier McGuinty went on YouTube mm -hmm. back in February, I guess, almost a year ago, and basically said, "Here's what we need." Did you see that video when I, it came I, out? I watched the video again today in preparation. And what did you think of it? So, um, I think he's very good at smiling. Um, <laughs> after he makes a comment, he throws in a really lovely smile. Yeah. Um, the thing between him and, and Ms. Broughton both is the constant talk of a conversation, but I, I don't know everything about education, but I know that generally when I teach conversation, one person talks, the other person listens, then they switch, and then that goes on over and over again until you have some kind of a discussion. But for him to go on YouTube and essentially use the same talking points that they're still using today, to me shows that there was never an intention to be flexible and to actually have a conversation. It was basically, this is what we're going to do, you're gonna like it, and if you don't like it, too bad. I know when the first negotiations happened in 2011, people that I work with have been teaching for a while started telling me to save money because the government clearly wanted us to go on strike. You think the government wanted you to go on strike? That's, that was the impression that I was given. A government that had not missed one no. day of education due to labor disputes you think wanted you to go on I'm strike? Not, I'm saying that's what the, the feeling from perception. the people that were around the negotiations was, was the perception mm -hmm. was the government is coming in, they want to create some kind of a kerfuffle so that, you know, it'll... Helps them save money if they don't have to pay. David, let me get you on this. Well, I'd, uh, I'd back it up a bit. Mm -hmm. I think when you get a banker to write your education policy, <clears throat> you're looking for, uh, you're not prioritizing the, the needs of the classroom. What's that a reference to, a banker? To the Drummond Report. Oh, I see, okay. So Don Drummond sets the tone, there's no money, uh, we're heading into a financial disaster, and then what that sets it up for August, which is a by-election in Kitchener. And you're looking at the Tories looking strong, and the Liberals want to look strong in, in front of, against Labour. So they're, they're going up against the Tories, and they're saying, look, we're legislating teachers. This makes us look strong. What they didn't necessarily anticipate was that, the, was that there would be a rally to the NDP. But the Kitchener by-election would have taken them into majority territory, which would have let Dalton McGuinty retire quite nicely with his legacy. But I'm inferring from what government. you're saying that you think this whole education crisis was designed to get a by-election victory? Uh, I'd say that was, yes. a, I mean, these are the people from, from Kitchener, down. but yeah. Okay, you're definitely. from Waterloo. Yep. That's your sense of it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kitchener tell me how that makes any sense at all. Well, um, th the way I look at it is, uh, as soon as we got when we got to the stage where the bill had been proposed, and, and of course, once it was passed, it was online, and so I pulled out the bill and read it a few times. Didn't quite understand all of it, but got to a few things that really I didn't understand. And I said, you know, I really don't get how you can write <clears throat> a piece of legislation that says uh, there are limits on jurisdiction of arbitrators. So. They may not make a decision or inquire into whether or not it is constitutionally valid or is in conflict with the Human Rights Code, or that the minister or lieutenant governor shall question or review this in any court. No review in any court. Um, there will be restrictions on review by arbitrators with the Ontario Labour Relations Board. This is insanity. This is not democracy. We don't write laws that say, I'm right, even when I'm wrong, and you will do what I say, and you won't be able to go to anybody, even the normal routes that you would take, to say, gosh, this law appears to be undemocratic. I okay. want to take it to the courts. But again, we're, I, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves here. That's, that's the Bill 115 story. Right, but even how before, does it tie in? But hang on, even before 115 came along, the government was saying things, Catherine, like, we sat down at a table with the Elementary, mm -hmm. Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario representatives, negotiations lasted an hour, they got up and left, and that was the sum total of bargaining. And I think what they maybe left out of that information was that what ETFL was told at that meeting, which was 
a non-typical meeting, a discussion table meeting that FO attended voluntarily that is not part of the normal bargaining process, that they still attended voluntarily. And during the course of that hour, they were told, here's what you're going to get. And if you don't sign it by March, we will put legislation into place that will force you to take it. At what point, like, why would they stay? I, I mean, at that point, I, I, it is my understanding that that meeting only lasted an hour, but it wasn't, it wasn't a typical bargaining meeting. And it wasn't, as, as Lee has said, it certainly wasn't a conversation. Was the minister in that meeting, to your knowledge? I, I'm not sure. I do, I do believe I was told that, that Premier McGinty phoned in and was, was speaking himself. From what I have heard about that, Lee, I'll get you to comment on this. From what I have heard, the Premier did phone in, was not anticipated to phone in. It was kind of yes. a surprise. Oh, the Premier's on the line. And from what I understand, he said, look, at, I'm going to ask all of you people for some very difficult things right now, but our back's up against the wall. We've got no money. I respect what you do, but I need you to give us a two-year pause. That's what he said. And as I understand it, our union OSSTF agreed to that two-year pause. Mm -hmm. But that, that keeps continually getting pushed to the back burner. So the, 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 the message from the Liberal Party is the teachers won't take a pay freeze, the teachers won't take a pay freeze. Our union has said, we've agreed to your pay freeze. What's, what's your problem? Why are we still in this boat? And um, you know, it seems the Liberal push is just to continually repeat the same sound bites and make it seem that it's all about a pay freeze that we've essentially agreed to. Ryan, did you think that the zero plus zero pause, as the government liked to call it, was uh a major stumbling block in getting an agreement here? I, I think that uh, pay freeze is a little bit of double speak. Uh, to me, it's a pay cut, not a pay freeze when you when you factor in inflation. Uh, and I, I agree that, uh, that the government's been regurgitating uh, the same arguments that this is about wages and that, uh, you know, um, but really, and they talk about how we've, always, we've gotten such great gains in our wages, but really those gains have just, just counted for inflation for the cost of living. Uh, so, yeah, I agree. But let me understand this, D David. Did you think that the did you think that the teachers were entitled to more than zero plus zero, when so many other unions across the public sector were settling for zero plus zero? I don't think it was necessarily the zero plus zero. I think it was, as Adrian mentioned, it was a bit of a provocation. It was an attempt to look really strong in front of the public in front of the Tories who were, who were moving up in the polls and to say, look, we've drawn the line and the teachers can't cross it because we've legislated it. There's no way around this. And if Dalton McGinty knew that he was going to step down and a new leader was going into a spring election, what's better than to say, look, we have brought in full day kindergarten. We have a world class education system. And you know what? We've also kept costs in line. We've kept the teachers we've subdued the powerful teachers union and that just may be what Kathleen Wynne says in May. Let me read something. We got a ton of feedback uh, as you might imagine in anticipation of doing this program and here's what somebody wrote and we're going to put it up on the screen for everybody to read along at home. Ontario teachers received three percent in each of the last four years while the province and taxpayers dealt with declining wages and job losses. They also received improvements to their health care plan and more prep time. Pensions and benefits have all but disappeared in the private sector. I don't think governments have any business using our tax dollars to provide better pensions, health care, benefits and working conditions for the public sector than what they're willing to either provide or legislate for all. I wonder how much more teachers are willing to pay in taxes to provide like pensions, health care, benefits and working conditions for all Canadians. Okay, go ahead, Dave. Put it this way. In the last quarter century, we've had free trade, and free trade has successfully lowered the standard of living of the blue-collar middle class. Manufacturing workers were middle class in this province, and they've slipped. And now those same conservatives who sold us free trade are back, and they're saying, well, look, you're paying a lot of taxes to fund the civil service. They should come down, too. I think that's the wrong way to look at it. Instead of saying, let's bring down the civil service, the civil service unions, the public sector unions, should be saying, how do we bring up the people who have slipped, in the blue collar middle class? Wendy, follow up? I think that we, we make this mistake of, of pitting these two groups against one another when really they're enmeshed. People have to buy the things that 
the corporations are making. They don't all buy their own materials. I mean, we are the people who, um, as middle income earners, are the ones who are out buying cars and buying houses, and which is what is expected of us. And so this is a social contract. We need to look at the fact that this is an issue for all of Ontario, and we need to look at it in a way that provides for balance. So we need to look at the people at the bottom and we need to say, gosh, that is not what we want to see in our democracy. Okay, you guys and are we need at the to bottom. look at the top. I'm not saying we're at the bottom. Okay. No, I'm not no, saying we're at the not. bottom. Absolutely yeah. not. But the other thing that people do is they compare teachers who are at the top, teachers, doctors, nurses, who are at the top of this earning segment in the public sector, and you compare us to the bottom of the private sector. That's not really fair. I mean, let's get some equality going on here and looking at things that are comparable. We need to look at this as a problem for all of Ontario. This is definitely an economic crisis. And one of the things that we need to look at is, is there equality in what people are paying? I know what I pay as a percentage of my income. And let me tell you, I'm pretty certain that those top corporations who are saying that they're paying my salary, which they're not, by the way, um, any more than I'm paying my salary, um, are they're not paying, as far as I'm concerned, their fair share. Well, Adrian, <clears throat> let me get you to speak more directly to the graphic here that we just put up, which essentially mm -hmm. is we've got a public sector and a private sector. Right. The private sector has been through hell over the last mm -hmm. six, seven years. The public sector has essentially been uh, protected from much of the ravages of the past Great Recession. And this person's point is you want to see your taxes go up dramatically so that you guys can have a pay, for, a pay increase. That's one of the questions. And I, benefit increases and health care increases and so on. I, I really don't. I think the notion of, of pay rises is absolutely a red herring in this. Mm -hmm. I'd agree with everyone here. Um, speaking to as many teachers as I have in um, uh, ETFO, um, there's no one I know that has said, this is disgusting. I won't take this 2%. It's about having the ability, um, it's about having the ability to be properly valued for what we do. The way it looks to me is that the, what the government's tried to do, I think, with this legislation is to cherry pick the best bits of the way the private sector works and the bits that it wants from the way the public sector works. So if it was treating us like private sector, it would say, hey, folks, you've got to show fiscal restraint. Uh, no one can have a pay rise. So the private sector would take that. But if you're public, uh, the public sector, it's saying, OK, well, you've got to accept that part of the public sector argument but you can't go on strike either. And I'm like, hang on, you've either got to decide whether you're treating us in a, in a public sector way, which would you think would lead to some kind of performance related benefit or something that would be uh, incentivization, further incentivization, because I don't believe any of us are, are sat around this table or in the staff rooms we all belong to. For the money, we would all have gone and done different things if that were the case. Yeah. Yep. But if you're going to then, if there is not going to be the performance related incentive that you get in the private sector, then there has to be some degree of protection in the private sector. Well, Tim Hudak has talked about some performance incentives in the public sector. Are you right. up for that? Um, it all depends on how carefully the, mechanism of, the mechanisms of evaluation are calibrated. If they're calibrated correctly, on principle, I don't object. But if it's used as a blunt tool, it will be a complete disaster. Okay. Catherine, so, let me get you on this. Um, we hear this in sports negotiations all the time, right? When there's a contract dispute or when players are locked out or they go on strike or something, they say it's not really about the money. But then the del you, know, you delve down deeper and guess what? It's always about the money. So... People watching this tonight may th hear you folks saying we were okay with zero and zero and it's not about the money, but that doesn't mean they don't think it's, it's not about the money. And particularly when you consider the sick days that were a part of all this and the request that teachers give back half the sick days, I guess it was, that you have accumulated okay. over the years. I, all of my Speak to that if you would. To the sick days sure. specifically, I do, I do tire of the of the whole it's all about the money because I literally haven't spoken to one teacher who said no I want more money that's never happened the sick days are a bit of an issue um, for many teachers and I can see why they are I understand that why the government felt they needed to take them away I do kind of on a basic level understand the the reasoning behind it the simple fact of the matter is however that that my sick days were my property. They belonged to me, and they were negotiated far before my time. 
um, and they're mine. And the people who sign your paycheck don't come and take away your car because they decided retroactively that they didn't have the money in hindsight to have given paid you enough to go buy the car. So they, those were your days, and you feel they were kind of illegally they, confiscated. They were my from days, you. and I never was under any illusion that they would help me to retire early. They were a, a short-term sick leave plan that I didn't squander my sick days. I put them into a bank because who knows what will happen one day in the future. Okay. I, I want to hear from everybody on this, but first, just to set this up a little better, we've talked about this numerous times on this program and I want to play a little clip from a previous show which I think maybe helps put this in context a little more. Uh, control room, I'm on number six, bottom of page two, the Doug Little clip number four. Roll tape, please. This was a management request when it first came in many, many decades ago to cut down on teacher sick days. It was a management idea. That was because teachers had made very little money. Now that teachers make a good deal more money, the program has become very expensive. And many boards have negotiated this away. But you have to look at a collective agreement as a many-faceted agreement. We would like, the, the boards say, we would like to take that away every round of negotiations. The teachers say, how are you going to compensate us for taking it away? The boards say, no, we just want to take it away. The teachers say, forget about it. Everything is a deferred wage. Mm -hmm. It's all a, a certain amount of money in the end. So if you don't want to pay it as a wage, you'll pay it in this other form, a medical benefit, a health benefit, uh, or something else like that. And who like pays that. the premium, Doug? The, the, of course the taxpayer does, <laughs> and it's, it's earned money. And I don't think any teacher handshakes when they, when they reach for their paycheck in this province. From almost a year ago in this program. So is it about the money then? No, I think with the sick days, the issue is that that's from a past contract. So those are previously negotiated with people, you know, like you said, before we were, we were even working as teachers. So I come into a job and you tell me instead of salary, I'm going to pay you with sick days. And if you don't use them, you can bank them. But that costs the government money. Absolutely it does. So it is about the money. It, no, but it's about the money from a past contract. My wife's a chartered accountant, so she knows about business more than I do. I'm an English teacher. But her argument was... In business, if you're going to change something like sick days, you grandfather it in. So for me, I used at most, the most sick days I ever used was last year because my daughter was sick and I missed five days of school. So of my 20 sick days, the most I've ever used is five. Of those days, now I had 160 roughly in the bank. I'm 300 pounds. Some point down the road, I'm either having a heart attack or I'm getting cancer. I accept that. Great Danes don't live long. So <laughs> I understand that. So for me, I, I was realistic about it. I'm not a baby boomer. I'm from Generation X. There's a whole bunch of baby boomers that are teaching that are all going to retire. Obviously, to me, I understood that that money wasn't going to be there when I retired. But the security of having the days in case I actually got sick, that was why I was holding on to my days. I, I, I realized that by the time I retire in 2032, I'm not getting my, well, my money for my Adrian, sick days. Adrian, you know that the sick, uh, if I understand this properly, the idea behind sick days it was not intended to be an early retirement program. No, it no, was no, intended it, to be, wasn't. if you no. need to be sick, no. that's what they're there for. Exactly. But it had turned into an early retirement it, program. It had turned into it. And thus the problem, no? Yes. Uh, but there's I, got to be other different, better solutions than yes. to just, than just strip them. them. Right. Yeah. It's, one that's, to say to someone, it's one thing to say to someone, you know what, you're not getting your duty when you retire. It's another thing to say to someone, you know those 160 days yes. that you didn't use where we didn't have to bring in a supply teacher and still pay you mm -hmm. we're just going to take those from you because you did a great job by not being sick but yeah, yeah. too okay. bad we're Adrian, taking come on. I've, I've really got some strong thoughts about this here I don't ever like you I don't ever expect to have those or to retire with them I will be delightfully happy to retire with zero right um, but you're right you can't take them away all in one go and this is why I'm thinking all but the situation always makes me think like it needs some form of, of sensible forced mediation for instance I don't know why no one has put forward the idea and said, okay, let's grandfather it. If you have 200 sick days and you choose to retire in the next six months or, tw or 12 months, you keep those. Every day or week you, ch you go past that point, then the, wheel ca the needle calibrates the other way. So over the next five years, which is probably the fiscal lifespan we're talking about, about trying to solve the budget deficit, those sick days will gradually go away and we will go back to the numbers that we currently have. That way no one has the, the sick day equivalent of sticker shock and goes, all this time I put in in the classroom and didn't take this. But, the same token, but by the same token, you can then still fix you can take away not just that element of the financial equation, but also it would go a long way towards altering the public's perception of entitled teachers who are banking their sick days. I mean, the other thing as well that I think has been missing in the communication, I haven't heard from anyone say, exactly how many teachers are we talking about? Are we talking about 1,000 teachers across the, across the province, 10,000? And 
Um, Do we know the should, answer to that? I, I don't. No, no one's ever no said one that to me. So I feel like it's a bit of a red herring. That I'm sure someone somewhere has the numbers that could say, without divulging anyone's privacy, could say there are 4,000 teachers well, age 50 and above that have this many sick days. So this is the exact hey, number Catherine, of liability. Catherine, so, the, fa the fact is that the <coughs> Minister of Finance has just banked 1.1 billion in savings for next year because of the sick day money he's not going to have to pay. That's real money. No, and I and that's that's my understanding of why the government felt that type of strong action needed to be done and it needed to be done in August before the school year started because they were under threat of having their credit rating reduced. Yes. And on paper, the minute they took away those sick days, they saved 1.1 billion dollars. And the fact that they a few days later, wrote off $1.4 billion in unpaid taxes is a oh, whole other issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, what's that, what's that a reference to? That just the, uh, the media release that came out very soon afterwards about them writing off $1.4 billion well, yeah, because, in uh, unpaid taxes. Okay, people weren't paying their taxes. So and and they just decided to write that off. Right. And then they're, yes. But that's that's got to drive you nuts, it, eh? it, Well, it is a little because it is a short term solution. On paper, they saved $1.1 billion. Billion dollars, sorry. But I do also know that the numbers I've been given are that the average number of sick days used by a teacher are 6.4 per year. Per year. Yeah. And now that means that those the teachers are being responsible with their sick days because we don't have a short term term disability plan and that's what they're there for they're there for if we need them mm -hmm. and now the, the the things you hear at at the staff room table are if all they're giving me is 10 sick days and i'm not even allowed to bank those i'll be taking 10 sick days wendy well and let's be clear about this i've been teaching for 24 years i hit the wall of 40 with some very interesting impacts i had to have Sorry, surgery I hit the wall of 40 oh, yeah, when at 40 when at i turned 40, 40. Okay. um so i've been teaching since i was in my 20s and um i am one of those people i've used my entire sick bank i had to have several knee surgeries um in quick succession i had one and then i had another one and then i had another one a year after that i had one last year um knowing that as at the time my husband was starting his own business, he had been laid off in the company that he was in, and I was the only wage earner in my home. And to know that we had that, uh, that I wasn't going to have to give up my home because I couldn't pay the bills was exactly what I thought that bank was about. Personally, I know that there are lots of people who uh, perceived it as something they would cash out at retirement. That was never anything that I perceived. I looked at it as, thank goodness I will have days when I can be paid when I am actually, you know, in a hospital and I can't be teaching and I won't lose my house. Let's go to Blind River. Ryan, can you weigh in on the sick day issue? Sure can. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying that I belong to a board where there is no gratuity payment uh, upon retirement. I'd also like to weigh in on the idea, maybe the economic argument, that, uh, you know, it's taxpayers' dollars that are going to these major corporations. And, um, and quite often you're starting to see in the news that the, these plans are taking these, these basic, uh, these, corp these bailouts from taxpayers that people like me and uh, many other Ontarians pay for. And they just, uh, they take that money and they go across the border or somewhere else and set up shop. Whereas if you invest in people who live in a community and have stake, a stakehold in that community, They'll, uh, that, that money comes back to the government in, in the form of uh, many different types of taxes. And uh, we're, we're seeing our tax dollars disappear. Uh, one of the panelists mentioned uh, the one point something billion dollars that was written off in corporate taxes. You know, uh, I think that that's the real argument, not, not sick days. You're saying that, but David, I want you to help us with this. Because it, it, you know, we're all on Facebook and Twitter these days, and I'm, whenever we did a program on this, we got lots of feedback on it. And one thing I heard numerous times was, teachers just don't get how bad the economy is out there and how desperately the government needs to save money and how, much, how well they have had it and therefore how much they have to contribute to making sure that this province doesn't go over a fiscal cliff, if I can use that overused expression. Right? I'm, not, I'm not going to disagree with that to an extent. I think the sick days is, to some degree, a bit of a red herring. If you look back at the 70s, at the 60s, you had a strong manufacturing sector in Ontario. You, my dad was able to pay off his house in Bloor West Village in, uh, in a few years on, on a on a manufacturing salary, as were many, many, many okay. people. We know those days but are gone. Here's the thing. 
why doesn't everybody have those kind of sick days the way they used to with their collective agreements. Uh, Ryan mentioned that companies are going across the border. You look at Lansing, Michigan is getting Oshawa's Camaro line from GM. That's because they passed right to work legislation. So I think we have to step back and take a look at the bigger picture. Why are companies able to make these decisions like pulling jobs out of Ontario after the Canadian government has sunk billions of dollars into propping them up. I don't think that's fair. And I think somebody needs to be held accountable for that. Are you that. saying that the Prime Minister of the country ought to be running GM and making the decisions about where cars are built or not built? We used to. We used to have the Auto Pact. That was exactly what the Auto Pact did, and that was exactly why we, Ontario had a yeah, prosperous you, manufacturing system. I appreciate system. your position, but you, you, you know you are constantly saying, that's the way it used to be, it's not that way anymore. The reality is, it's not that way anymore, David. Right. So and those are political decisions that get made and need Okay, to be leave then, Catherine. Yeah. Okay. So we moved from Sault Ste. Marie to Southern Ontario in 1989 um, so that my father could work at the Toyota plant in Cambridge. So my father works in the manufacturing sector. He has a very good job. Um, you know, he has more than one trade and he makes a lot of money. I chose to take a completely different route and become a teacher. Part of the reason why I became a teacher, I had an opportunity to work at Toyota where I would have made more money than I make now, but I became a teacher partially because, as I heard from teachers that I went to high school with, in some ways education is recession proof because you're always going to have clients in your students and if a country is in a bad economic state, one of the ways they can get out of it is by having workers that are you know, trained to do things. Whereas, so we're basically saying we need really great workers, we need them to be trained well in schools. We have a prime minister and a minister, or sorry, a premier and a minister who get up on TV and say we're the best, you know, one of the best education systems. Our teachers are amazing. They're pumping out graduates at record levels. Our scores on the literacy tests are going up. Here's your pay cut. So if you think about the private sector, when a company's making all kinds of, you know, really great products and being profitable, there's a reward for the workers. But in the public sector, apparently, if you do a really good job and you pump out lots of great graduates and they pass the literacy tests like crazy, you get a pay cut. But I'm wondering what the alternative is for the guy. And uh, forgive me, you, you, you all understand my role in this program sure, is to yeah, kind of provoke sure. you a little Absolutely, bit. And, yes. Okay, it shouldn't, no, don't no, infer no, anything no, from no, these no, questions. No. The province was staring at a $14 billion deficit. Right. Is the answer to that $14 billion deficit to crank the pump even higher and or, no. Or, no, and, and, and give you more money? Ever asked no. To, no. Ask the government. no, nobody's, nobody's ever asked the money. government to do that. This is what, when I'm saying, it, the, the idea of withdrawing the sick days save the, the government money immediately on paper, and in the long run, it will not. In the long run, it will cost the government money. How come? Because the 6.4 days that teachers were taking in which the government had to pay a supply teacher and pay the teacher who was taking their sick days will now jump to 11. Because they'll take that, all 11. M many will. Most will. Because what's the incentive not to? And... So they'll have to hire more supply teachers to they'll cover off to those days. They'll have to hire more supply. So in fact, the savings it's a are knee illusory. Jerk, it was a knee-jerk yeah. policy that they exactly what Drummond cautioned they, against. Yeah. As far as a new uh, long-term disability program that yes. they're going to have to fund that to the make up isn't giving them to any make money up the difference. Fund. And there is out there, there are people saying, you know, gosh, when I really crunch the numbers, this is going to cost more money. Mm -hmm. And the other they piece know that. This. Don't they know this? They surely don't. They don't think long term. It's, though. Yeah, it's, this is not. The election cycles. No, I, and yeah. that's. And I would agree, this has been such a learning experience for me because I'm so not a political person. I am an educator, and to educators, educator, education is about children. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned is that to the government, education is about politics. And what it was right. was something that on paper, look what we just did with Bill 150, yeah. and we saved 1.1 million Ryan, come dollars. on in here. Give us your view. Uh, you know, the, go the government never really did enter in negotiations. And I understand the government is in... Uh, uh, terrible f fiscal uh, fiscal times, but I don't care how bad fiscal times are. You do not roll over people's charter rights and freedoms. Charter rights and freedoms are one of the most beautiful things about living in this country. And uh, you know, it, it's very very dangerous when you start when you start getting rid of those things. And right now, what's happened with education workers? We're not just talking about teachers. We're talking about educational assistants and other educational workers and secretaries and support staff is because we work in this field, we have less rights in this province than other workers and other citizens. And that's, that's terribly wrong. And uh, it needs to stop. It's a very, very dangerous precedent to set uh, for this country.
More feedback from the web here. I want to read this to you guys, and then we'll discuss this. I wonder how many parents understand that teachers are not compensated as part of their salary for those extracurricular activities. When your child's geography teacher is the coach for the volleyball team, they are basically volunteering to do work. Uh, they're volunteering to take work to do at home after supper instead of completing it at school during the normal working day. What if your employer told you that instead of working on your normal duties from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., you were to lead an after-school craft time for your co-workers' children, but you were still expected to make up that time away from your desk by either staying until 7 p.m. or taking the work home with you? And all for no increase in your salary, even though you're now working 50 hours a week instead of 40. That is what those extracurricular activities for your children mean to teachers and their jobs. To which you around this table say? Um, I coached three sports at various times in my career. So you're, I would coach football in the fall, I would coach basketball in the winter, and I'd coach girls rugby in the spring. I also now open the weight room in the mornings for an hour. Should you be paid for doing that? I, I don't think I should be paid for doing that, but I don't think I should be vilified in the media when I choose not Absolutely, to. Absolutely, sir. If parents have come to, and the government has come to, mm -hmm. expect this as part of a well-rounded, important, citizen-based education, it's a problem when you take it away, even when it's voluntary. Agreed? Absolutely, it's a problem. It's also a problem when you take away people's charter rights. Yes. Yes. You, yeah. So, I mean, you can't, the, the problem with the government is, in my opinion, is, you, you know, you look at the financial part of it. So the liberals vote the MPPs a raise and then tell teachers that they have to tighten their well, belts. Well, hang on. These MPPs haven't had a raise in six years. So let's That's start. That's fantastic. But, I mean, their salary versus my salary. You look at the raise that Dalton McGinty gave himself. Yeah. That equals a, a teacher's salary. So we're, we, no, I just said though, Lee, he hasn't had a, he hasn't had a raise in six years. But they did. But they did. They did a great big bump. Yeah. What's that? They did a great big bump right before that. So there was a there was a raise that. Well, hang on. You guys aren't going to talk salaries, are you? You no, guys have had good salaries. And, and, no, no, no. It's not exactly. Good but but it's the thing about, about it is, is if if you said to me, Lee, I'm going to get you to you have to eat craft dinner tonight because we're really poor. I'm just going to go across the street and have a lobster. That isn't. But who's really saying that? That's their, their position is that we, the, the province is in dire need of people to tighten their belts. Right. But they're not tightening their own belts. Well, well wait a sec. Uh, so, hang on. I'm missing something here. You got zero. They got zero. How exactly are you eating craft okay. dinner and they're eating lobster? We don't get zero. Can we just start with this? We get minus 1.5%. Let's, let's get this out of the... Well, the then media they do keeps too. saying you get zero, but you get zero, you get zero. But they do too. What do you mean? Because if you're both getting zero, then you're both falling behind. You're, you're talking about inflation. No, right? I'm not talking about talking? inflation. I'm what talking, talking about, about the fact that they have said in, in lovely McGinty ease, well, we're going to give you three unpaid days. Pardon me, Mr. Ray? Um, that's a pay cut. It's 1.5% of my salary. That's a pay cut. That's not zero. You also took away half of my sick days. That's a pay cut. I don't even want to know what the percentage of that is. So let's get real about the fact that the media and the government keep continually saying teachers are whiners, they want more money, blah, 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 blah. First of all, not only did we agree to 0% back in February of last year, but now we're taking it on the chin and saying, okay, we will take this. Well, you're taking away 1.5% of our salary, and we get it. We understand. But you may not turn me into a villain. You may not say that I am horrible because what I choose to do with my free time is something that I've chosen to put my energy toward fighting the government, who I think is treating us heinously, rather than looking after students who are in my gay straight alliance. Catherine, then uh, Adrian. I it, it still somehow it always manages to come back to money. And for myself personally, it is not about that. And even the 1.5% cut, if, if necessary, fine. If it, anything about finances scares me, it's the wording in the Memorandum of Understanding, which states that the PDT will review PDT? the provincial discussion table, okay. the, the bankruptcy lawyers, even after this imposed contract is finished, will be reviewing the qualifications and salary grids where applicable and will change it with a view to future sustainability. Right. It's a great big question mark hanging over our heads and I'm okay with things if to do my part for the economy with the way things are right now, but wording like that terrifies me. Adrian. Um, I, I'd agree with that. There is, there is a longer term thing of what's gonna happen in 2014, but in the meantime, the extracurriculars, I think 
the reason, my understanding is the reason those have, have, uh, have been used as um, an issue by the unions in this is because we haven't been given any other There's choice. No other well, the, the, uh, the government's position means that um, there was no flexibility in the negotiation when they came to us and now they've imposed Bill 115, we are not allowed to, to appeal the bill or take any form of any other action. So tell me this and then, if, yeah. if, if I hear what you're saying yeah. and teachers have, if teachers feel their rights are being infringed upon, they have to respond the way they have to respond. Mm -hmm. How does it look when we learn that your unions are telling you if you provide those extracurriculars, we're going to fine you 500 bucks. That's, no, 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 none of us, I, I, I haven't certainly seen that. I don't believe it. No, 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 they're not allowed to do that. Yeah. We're What's not, a lot? We're, we're not in a legal strike position, so they can't impose anything against us. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they can ask in a voluntary sense, but they can't, they can't say you must. They can say we would like you to, and they can phrase that however they like, but it's a yes. we would like you to. And if it's, a, if it's a we would like you to, then there cannot be any penalty for that. The only wording I ever saw was we invite you to think yes. about how you want to spend yes. your volunteer time. Yeah, and if you're and a teacher can who... I, can I just I finish, mean, though? Yeah. I, I, most teachers volunteer to do things that they love to do. And the, the okay. things that I volunteer to do, I would very much like to get back to doing. But unfortunately, that's not an option right now because this is literally the only recourse that I have. And I would really like that when my children grow up, they still get to live in a democracy. And small things, big things start very small. And I, compl I completely agree with that. But that brings me back to one of my main ideas. It's about, the whole thing is about optics. It's been so easy for the government to vilify us in the, in the mainstream media. I don't feel that the way we've been presented accurately reflects what I, what, not just what I see around this table, but what I see in the staff room, what I see at my union Where's meetings. Where's it off? Pardon? Where's it off? Yeah. Um, by calling it a wage freeze. By calling it a wage freeze. I, I, think, I think some of that is about, is about and again, I'm, I'm sure I'm saying something that is going to get me into all kinds of trouble for this, but I'm not the only one who feels it. Um, I think it's about the way our, our union has chosen to represent us. I often feel that they've used, uh, that they've used a 20th century, a 20th century approach to fight a 21st century media war, and and hey, I'm the union steward for my school. I will do whatever the union tells me. I will get the union members at my school to do exactly what the union asks them to do. But just because I'm a, um, to use this analogy, a foot soldier in, soldier in the trenches, you can believe in the war, but you don't necessarily have to agree with the strategy that the generals are taking about going over the next okay, particular here, hill. Here's the conventional wisdom. Yes. Uh, people love their doctors. They don't necessarily love the Ontario Medical Association. Right. People love their teachers. They don't necessarily like the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation. Right. Is that what we've got going on here? Um, I'm feeling some of that. It's a, this is exp Again, this is my personal expression, um, but I'm not alone in feeling that we haven't sold it. I very much feel that the um, the union needs to approach this issue as if we're marketing ourselves, not to each other, because most most of the people I speak to believe in the cause, but market ourselves to the public. So the public don't think, oh, here's the teachers, they're entitled, they have all these sick days, they have this great salary. Mm. Um, I've not seen things come from the leadership that's reflected, that's really explained it to the average person that lives on all of our streets, the actual situation we're in and sold that in a way that, that the general public actually gets it. If okay. they had, David, we wouldn't be in that position. Let me position. pick up on what Adrian yeah. said. In Chicago in September, the, the Chicago Teachers Union went on a 12-day strike against a very, very well-entrenched and hostile city government, and they won. And they won because for the past three years, they have been reaching out to low-income communities, explaining to them, saying, this is why school reform is bad for you. Bad for your kids, bad for our schools, and bad for teachers. And when we go into bargaining, we're going to make sure that we bargain for all the things that are going to make schools great. And when they went on strike, they had massive outpourings of public support. Something similar happened in Alberta in 2002. They led a very strong campaign. Public on your side here? It could be if we worked harder. I, and if we worked, and if we worked smarter, and may I just say, yeah. I think the the notion of voluntary, uh, the expectations of extracurriculars has become an utter red herring. Mm -hmm. The issue is the Liberals did something undemocratic, and they need to be held accountable for that. Right. And, and we what does that mean? It means that it means that 
public sector unions, especially the teachers, need to be working with communities so that community... You're, you're, you're pulling your punches here. What you mean to say is, I think, we're I going to do actually, everything we can to defeat them in the no, next election. absolutely not, because the yeah. alternative is a lot worse. Scary. But yeah. we, we... What about need, the NDP? They are it's still the third party, yeah. and they yes. need... We need public sector unions, and okay. teachers need to bring help communicate with people. Catherine, make public the on your side. I just, I wanted to touch on that. I've been working hard um, outside of school hours trying to raise awareness about Bill 115 through the use of social media. Um, a colleague and I have started a Facebook page and it's developed quite a, a good number of members and some of them are parents. Um, is the public on our side? There's a great, great many who are not, who feel inconvenienced by the loss of extracurriculars. I am surprised though when I view my page at the number of parents and public who are supportive. It's just that those people aren't as noisy as the ones who aren't. Obviously the unhappy person is going to speak louder than the happy person. And the thing I always find myself coming back to and saying is it is a terrible inconvenience when your child doesn't get to participate in volleyball. I work for the elementary panel and so it's not quite as impactful as when there's, there's no extracurriculars mm -hmm. in secondary. But I'll have parents say to me, it's a big deal. My child was, you know, set to receive a scholarship. And my response to that is, if your child was set to receive a scholarship because of something a, a teacher gave of their time voluntarily to put them in a position to get that scholarship, how could you not throw your support behind the teacher who gave of their time to make sure that your child had those opportunities? Okay, I want to make sure the clock doesn't get away from us here because I think we're down to less than 10 minutes to go and we need to talk about the events of this past weekend. We have an incoming premier who is a former, if I may put it this way, relatively beloved minister of education. Most teachers I talked to thought she was terrific. And I want to know whether or not you think Kathleen Wynne is going to make any difference at all after she puts uh, her, I don't know, if she, I was going to say hand on the Bible and takes the oath of office, but she may not use a Bible, so I don't know. Once she becomes premier. Wendy, what do you say? I think that there is the potential um, for some movement. And my perspective is this. She has said that she's not going to tear up the contracts. We understand that. She's not going to tear, and they're not contracts, by the way. They are imposed working conditions. Working conditions. Yeah. Um, I think there's wiggle room. I think that we can meet and discuss the fact that we do not feel respected. We do not feel heard. And I think that having a woman who uh, has such excellent credentials as a negotiator is probably to everyone's benefit. Absolutely. So that's, do, do I hear a <clears throat> ray of hope in that? I would love for Kathleen Wynne to solve this problem with us. How does I would that? Love to have coffee with Kathleen. You would love to have coffee yeah. with Kathleen. Yes. I would. I would love to, to <laughs> for her to open the discussion. All we're asking for. We are the ones who. Every people. It's funny about agreements because people seem to think that this is some sort of thing that happens only now. This has happened every year, every single year that teachers teach it. We negotiate. We go for years without contracts in OSSTF because they send one back and they talk and we discuss it and they say, oh, well, our members need this. Okay, well, that's going to cost this. How are we going to make that work? And they make it work because it's a negotiation. They said it wasn't an option this time because if they didn't impose contracts as of Jan 1, you guys were going to get $400 million in increases automatically and they couldn't afford that. Okay, but the point is that we offered to sit down with them and discuss and to, to work as partners. They keep calling us partners. They don't treat us as partners. I mean, with partners like that, who needs enemies? Okay, Lee, what she said, the contract, oh, sorry, the imposed uh, contract, what did you call them? The working conditions. The imposed working conditions are going to stay. Right. There's no new money. What options does she have to make things better? I think that our union and the government needs to focus on 2014. I think, yes. to me, at this point, we're at the we're almost like kind of the stalking ex-boyfriend that's in the woods, going like, "You shouldn't have broke up with me. You shouldn't have broke up with me." Like we know that we're not going back, and I know anyways that we're not going back. We're not getting a new contract. That's ridiculous. The idea that they're going to rip it up and we're going to renegotiate a new contract. That's done. We lost that battle in my eyes. But I think what we have to do now is work together towards 2014. Because as much as people are upset at teachers and upset at unions, I don't really think that the, in the best interest of Ontario students is for Mr. Hudak to come in and, and take 2014 over. 2014 meaning when the contract expires. When the contract expires. comes up, yeah. right. Okay. Let me, uh, one little last piece of tape here, about 48 seconds. We've discussed this before on this program. Here, according to Doug Little, is the political reality of this issue yeah. in Ontario today. Roll tape. No government that takes on the teachers this way survives. 
Oh, no, uh, none of them have. None of them have. Yeah, that's right. uh, and and uh, Christy Clark will go down in British Columbia for what she's doing there. Bob Ray went down for this. Took two terms for Harris to go down. He was wounded the first time. Took Eves out the second okay, time. Here, They're going to lose. Here's and, the, and, and the liberals are going to come third in the next election if they do this. Here's yeah. the bigger question, though. Here's the bigger yeah. question. The teachers didn't like David Peterson in the late 1980s, mm -hmm. so they took him down. Yeah. Then they got Bob Ray. They mm -hmm. didn't like the social contract any better, so they mm -hmm. took him down, and they got Mike Harris. Yeah. I don't think they like that any better. No. So if they take this guy down, who's the education premier and who's given them pretty much everything they've wanted over the last eight years, do they really think they're going to get something better? It doesn't matter. The government has to get the message. You fight us, you lose. Ryan Forsyth, come on in here and tell us what you think Kathleen Wynne's appointment as premier portends. I think this is a wonderful opportunity uh, for public education in Ontario to sort of mend some bridges. We have to also remember that the, the Liberal government and Kathleen Wynne herself pioneered many, many uh, positive changes in public education in this province. So I think that her election is a chance to, to wipe the, the slate clean and uh, to begin a, a respectful dialogue that will restore goodwill uh, to public education in Ontario. Uh, and, you know, mean that the extracurriculars and, and uh, volunteering will come back and we can sustain this excellent education system we have. Uh, so that's, that's what I, I, I think you have to be hopeful as an educator. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, and you have to be able to move on. We teach our kids uh, to, uh, to be respectful, to forgive and to move on. And we can't, we can't be resentful and hold uh, what's happened in the past against uh, this new leader because we have to give her an opportunity. Okay. Um, what, about, what about what Doug Little said, which is, you cross teachers, you're going down. Is that true? I'm not, I don't have enough interest in the political world to, to know how to answer that. I know that it feels as though when all of these policies and decisions were made, they failed to talk to educators. And what I want to do is I want to go to work and feel respected for what I do. I have a great deal of responsibility. I'm responsible for the education, health, safety, well-being, and self-esteem of 20 children a day. It is not a small task. I want to feel as though I can hold my head high when I go to work. I don't want to continue to be vilified in the media anymore. I want to feel as though I am respected for what I do and that I have my charter rights. That is what I want. That was such a beautiful summation. I wish the show ended right now. <laughs> but, but we actually have a minute left. Go ahead, David. Back in the Harris days, confidence in schools was quite low, but confidence in teachers stayed high. So we were seen as making the best of a bad situation. I'm picking this up from Doug Hart at OISE. Now we have very high confidence in schools, or at least we did going into, into this. Highest it's been in 15 years. And we high, have high confidence in teachers. So I think we have to be careful as unions yeah. how we approach the next bargaining yeah. agreement and really work on communication. Because Kathleen Wynne is going to have a much better tone, but she's still dealing with no manufacturing sector, which means a smaller tax base. And if Caterpillar is leaving Ontario for Indiana, we have to really think about how we're going to make this work for all Ontarians. David, you're getting the last word today. Can I thank all of you for coming onto the program tonight? I hope we didn't vilify you tonight. I hope you feel you had a chance to get your views out there. Ryan Forsyth, the high school teacher at the Algoma District School Board, thank you for being there via Skype in Blind River, Ontario. Wendy Jackman from the Waterloo Region District School Board. Katherine Hansen, Peel District School Board. Lee Becker, Peel District School Board. David Banerjee, Toronto District School Board. Adrian Goodman, Toronto District School Board. Good of all of you to come in tonight. Thanks so much for your help on this. Thanks for Thank letting you. us speak. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.